OMDC, I think most of you know who we are, but just really briefly, we are the agency in Ontario that is responsible for economic development in the province in the creative industries. So literally our job is to help your industries grow and we do that through a variety of programs and services and tax credits and initiatives like IF. And in terms of supporting the independent feature film industry in Ontario, the combination of competitive tax credits, great location support, great crews, great infrastructure, all of this contributes to building a really, really strong industry in Ontario. And in 2011, we had our best year ever. We had $1.3 billion of production activity in the province, and we're basically on track to have another really amazing year again. So hopefully, what I wish for you today is essentially that as you have your meetings and make those connections, that your project becomes much closer to the screen and that when you do get there, you bring your project back to Ontario. And so with that, um, I wish you a great day and a half and I'll turn it back over to Jen. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very quick. I just want to introduce Wendy Mitchell, the brand new, newly minted, very exciting editor of Screen International. She's going to be moderating the panel today with Film Nation, Beachside, and Alda Misa. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. I'm Wendy Mitchell. I'm the editor of Screen International. I'm American, but based in London. Not that that really matters, but we're all international here, so you have that information. Uh, I'm just going to introduce uh, the panelists to, to join me up here. We've got Michael Clark from Big Beach slash Be Beachside, their new low, low budget, lower budget, lower budget arm. Um, and we'll welcome Milan Popelka, close, close, from Film Nation. And last but not least, Jerry Halfstutter from Alda Misa. Yes. And I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves uh, fairly briefly and tell you what, what, a bit about their backgrounds and what, what you're up to now at your respective new or semi-new companies. Great. Great, it's my call. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, I think it's there. Hello. Hi. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Michael Clark. I, um, uh, I've done IFF uh, sort of on the, on the uh, here at Spice Road for the past few years, um, but it's nice to be back in this capacity doing the panel. So thank you, Jan, for having me. Um, uh, I work at a company called Beachside. We are a, uh, we're a new company. Um, we sort of spun off in the past few months from uh, a company called Big Beach, which is based in New York, um, which is a production and finance company. Um, and our goal is to focus in that, you know, what some people call the micro-budget sector, which is a sort of roughly $1 million and under space. Um, and we're trying to find new ways to produce, to finance, and also uh, potentially distribute in that world. Um, and we're excited by it. So. And is there anything current that you're working on? That no, we're you know? actually we, the past few months we've just been taking meetings and trying to figure out our slate. Okay. But um, but maybe you can remind us of a few big beach. So big, so the big beach. So the, the, yeah. the most recent movie, uh, actually, what kind of spawned this was this movie called Safety Not Guaranteed, which we produced at Big Beach, um, Film District released it earlier this year. Uh, it stars Aubrey Plaza, Mark Duplass, Jake Johnson, and um, that's what got us excited about this. Prior to that at Big Beach, you know, Big Beach has done Little Miss Sunshine, Already at Brothers, Sunshine Cleaning, Jack Goes Boating, Away We Go. Um, I'm probably forgetting a few in there, but... Uh, and th those movies are all a little bit larger budget. Uh, Safety Not Guaranteed was um, under a million dollars. Great. Milan, please. Hello. Also want to say thank you for, uh, for having us. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Milan. I'm the COO at Film Nation. Um, we are a sales agency, production development company, and now newly financier. Uh, films generally in the five to forty million dollar range. Um, we're based in New York, but we have offices in uh, LA as well. Um, we uh, are, are most well known for our sales agency, partly because that's something when uh, you start a sales agency, you can dive in, find movies, and, and go to market, and people know what you do. With production and development, it takes a little bit longer. Um, to get up and running, but uh, we have a few movies releasing this year and then next year, so we feel uh, pretty soon we'll kind of be seen equally as both. Um, we uh, focus on all kinds of movies. I think the movies that we hear, uh, have here at the Toronto Film Festival kind of are a good sampling of that. We have everything from uh, Looper, which opened the festival on Thursday. Uh, we have Terrence Malick's next movie, uh, To the Wonder, um, which is premiering on Monday. Um, Deepa Mehta's Midnight's Children, which I think came out of this program as well. Um, and then um, uh, Eli Roth's uh, 
uh, horror thriller aftershock. So um, those, that's what really brings us here. We're also selling new product and, um, and also looking for new projects as well. Great, thank you. Jerry. Uh, one thing Milan is not telling you is Film Nation is probably one of the preeminent sales companies in the world. Um, hi, I'm Jerry Hausfetter. Thank you for having me. Um, um, we, I am the COO of a company called Aldemisa. What does that mean? Uh, it's four kids' names strung together. Uh, I, Aldemisa is a reformatted company. It is a finance production development company and a worldwide sales company. Uh, currently, we have Jay Mansfield's car screening in the festival here. We just wrapped uh, production on Machete Kills, which is Robert Rodriguez directing the sequel to Machete. And we start shooting Sin City 2 uh, October 15th. Uh, our budget ranges go anywhere from $5 million to $60 million. Uh, we fully finance movies as well as sell them. Great, thank you. And you also worked at Essential and Miramax. Uh, and yeah, no, I've been around. Yeah. Um, say, where have I been? Uh, I founded Essential Entertainment, worked at Disney for 12 years, worked at Miramax, uh, worked at uh, Intermedia Films, um, and a few other places. But those are the most notable. Great. I want to start with Jerry. Um, something we talk a lot about at Screen is uh, accessing finance from new markets and emerging markets for film. And you obviously have a big Russian partnership with Alexander Rodansky, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the Russian influence and how that works. Um, yes, uh, my, the company Aldemisa is Russian, primarily Russian slash European backed. Uh, it is, you know, in, in Russia at the moment, there are, there are significant financial resources available from a number of different sources. Uh, I'm fortunate to we have, we have access to those sources. Uh, we also, uh, Alexander Rodinsky, who is one of our principals and financiers and producers, he also owns two, say, he owns actually two distributors, one in Eastern Europe and one in Russia that are end users. So we don't have to worry about selling those movies there. Um, and we um, are uh, moving right along here in terms of finding, you know, always in search of more movies. Um, obviously, film. I mean, Film Nation to a certain degree is competitive with us. Um, we usually lose, uh, but that's sort of about. That's a little bit about Aldemisa. Okay. And for Film Nation, is tapping into international finance becoming important? Has it been important? Is it something you're going to look at more? I mean, I think it, in terms of where you're finding money, it depends on the project and what sort of the natural fit is. Um, I think one of the things that we're finding really important when we finance our own movies is that that soft money piece, and I know something that you guys are talking a lot about here, is, is really critical because it, a lot of times it can get a movie over the hump of just barely makeable to actually makeable. Um, so we've actually shot movies in uh, Serbia and Hungary. Uh, we had a movie that we put together in Australia that took advantage of that producer offset, which is up to 40% of the budget. Uh, we uh, shot and financed a movie in Canada called House at the End of the Street. Um, that's coming out uh, in a couple of weeks with Jennifer Lawrence. Um, and, and the Ottawa rebate was actually quite critical because uh, even just that extra couple of percentage points is, and you guys know when you're putting the finance plans together, relying on pre-sales and some gap lending and whatnot, and then just filling that hole, and it's a really hard hole to fill just purely with equity. And the more you can stretch any one of those other pieces, the easier it gets. So we're, we're thinking a lot about what can we do in, you know, in, in Europe, in, in territories that have high production incentives, and how can we get creative um, because it can sometimes get it over the finish line. And Michael, I think of Big Beach as being very American, but does any finance for those American films ever come from abroad? No, I mean, it's actually kind of the opposite of the other two fellows. I mean, we, uh, you know, we fully finance ourselves, and I don't think at Big Beach we had, we had ever really made a movie using foreign pre-sales. The, you know, the, the sort of American indie ensemble comedies that we do don't translate that well over there. We always do okay um, in foreign sales eventually, but it's never enough that, that, um, that we need to go out and pre-sell them. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of the, the opposite end of the spectrum. It's, it's really not a big part of the business, and, and trying to figure out how to make it a part of the business is one of our goals. I mean, you look at Hollywood blockbusters; all these movies now are driven off of um, international uh, ticket sales, and, and you know the type of movies that we're talking about, <clears throat> these very um, indie American movies. It's really not a piece of the puzzle. So figuring out how to um, sort of how to translate that is is one of our challenges. I wanted to speak a little bit about, even if finance isn't coming from abroad, how important the international markets are when you're packaging a 
a project and, and selling it. And obviously, everybody's talking, oh, yes, it's, you know, the international box office is larger than domestic now, and it's becoming more and more important. But maybe you could put some real concrete examples of that together. Is it, is it every film? Does the Malik film have to sell around the world to be successful in your eyes? Or, or that's a loaded question. I think. Okay. There, there are, I mean, a couple a couple sides to that question. One is sort of when you're putting it together, when you're making a movie at the you know, 10 plus million, it's, it's really, really hard to get it financed. Um, a lot of people would say not ec economically uh, you know, intelligent to actually just take a huge risk unless there's, you know, you, uh, you can really properly value because the bigger the check that you're writing, obviously the more downside there is. And some of these movies, um, you know, that, the amount of pre-sales is, is hugely, hugely critical. Um, you know, we, we say we're not in the sales business, we're in the pre-sales business because it, it helps people get their movies made. So if you're making a $15 million movie, I mean, that better be a large component of that. The other thing with highly pre-selling movies is that you, the more equity, or the less equity that you're asking for, the more kind of control that you get and the more uh, you can make movies the way that you want to make them. So for filmmakers like Terry, you know, they'll approach us and they want to make the movie they want to make in as little inter interference as possible. And the less you can ask, uh, before you can green light that picture and make that movie makeable, the, the more they can make the movie that they want under the circumstances that they want. And that's one of the things that um, we try to do with filmmakers so they keep coming back, is give them the tools um, to make the movie that they want to make. Jerry, any thoughts on how important international sales are? Well, the, uh, what, I just want to go, I want to dial back one thing. No independent movie should be started or produced today without a soft money component. And I think that is really critical to everyone to understand that. I'm sure everyone in this room gets that, but whether you're shooting in, a, in one of these soft subsidy jurisdictions in the United States or overseas, it's critical to have that component because you're gonna need you're gonna need that component. In other words, to finance your movie. Uh, the second question was just how important international is versus domestic. Well, I, I mean, uh, you know, my mom was right. I mean, you for everyone who wants to finance their movies you know, international pre-sales are the engine that launched this movie. And it's critical that who is it, you know, what is the cast, what, who's the director? On a Terrence Malick, I, I believe it's more about Terrence Malick as a director versus who's going to be in Terrence Malick's movies. Because we know, everyone knows that Terrence Malick is going to attract a certain level of cast, which he always has and always will continue to do. But I mean, also you can finance a movie not necessarily based on, the, you know, the critical component of cast, but it's a director as well. And for us, and for me personally, we're very, very director-driven. Okay. I, I think the, one, of the, one of the reasons why um, we decided to make this company Beachside was kind of in response to the international, um, the, sh the shift towards international and pre-sales is um, we've, you know, we really value content more than anything else. So if, if someone's coming t to me and saying, look, you can only make this movie if it stars Bradley Cooper and Ryan Gosling, um, that's not, I mean, that's a challenge for us. We want to be able to make the, make the script, work with the director we want in whatever capacity. So for us to say, okay, if we make this movie for under a million dollars, we know that we can at least, and we're getting 30% back from Georgia or from New York State, that we know that um, uh, we can ha the movie can have that content and creative integrity that we want it to have without knowing that, okay, we're going we're gonna to have to get, you know, maybe Ben Affleck isn't right for this part, but we need to put him in the film because that's what's going to get us those sales in Europe. Um, so that's so. I think part of the reason why we created Beachhead is to, is to hedge against that a little bit and try to maintain some of that focus on content rather than focus on who the who the talent is. It seems when, like oh, sorry. Okay. You know, I'll, I'll agree with uh, a couple of things that you guys said, and especially Jerry, when you're talking about there, that a director can be a selling tool. You know, I know that a lot of times there's this impression that you know you need cast to sell a movie and it's huge cast but it really depends on a lot of factors i mean sometimes you can sell a movie based on a high concept and the idea is just so big um, that as long as the pricing is in line with the movie you're trying to make that can be enough or if you have a really you know top tier filmmaker um, that that buyers know is going to are going to make something distinctive and unique um, that can drive it again it comes back down to pricing if you're making a 50 million dollar movie you're going to need some cast if you're making a smaller one, it, it can be a number of things. It can be a highly, highly visible book um, that has awareness. It can be you know, a concept. It can be a filmmaker. And it's really just getting feedback and understanding you know, what are the value, what are the, what's the value of the elements that you have, everything from the script on up to the cast. What, what 
um, number should you be making that movie at? And then how do you play with those things to get yourself over the finish line? But it doesn't have to be just, you know, get me Jason Statham and you can make your movie. And without him, you can't make it um, based on pre-sales. It's, it's, it's much more nuanced and complicated. And that's why sales agencies are, you know, early in the process are useful because they can give you that feedback. So as you're packaging, you're saying, okay, well, I've got this actor. I know it's not enough to get it there. But what if I do this? Will that get me to the number that I need to? And if the answer is no, then you dial back and think about what other level at levelers you can move um, to get there. So when you get to that finish line, you've put together a movie that's viable, that makes sense from a distribution point of view, um, as opposed to just putting it together and then finding out once it's done, you know, what do I have to make this for to make it work? I mean, do you think valuations are pretty uh, acceptable in the market right now? I mean, it seems that maybe before the recession, the recent one, recession, things were getting a little inflated and star vehicles were getting a little crazy, but do things seem at the right levels of yeah, valuation our, now? Our view is, I mean, it, it, look, it depends on each territory. Some territories are growing rapidly, like China, Brazil, Russia. Um, some have obviously taken a hit with the Euro crisis and, and you know, uh, various other reasons, but we like to say it's not just that the market depresses and, and, and inflates uh, as a whole uniformly. Um, kind of what we're seeing more is that the trying to find that thing that works is less about uh, kind of like is it a good year, is it a bad year, but it's just narrowing the target. So in past years when it was, you know, the heydays, if, if you missed that target of what buyers really want by a little bit, maybe your numbers go down by 5%. Today, if you miss that target, those numbers go down by 30 or 40%, which is, you know, makes the difference between a good movie getting made or not. So it's really understanding what do buyers want, you know, what has distribution value, and then making sure that the project you're putting together fits that. So I think it's just more hitting a target as opposed to just, uh, now I have to make everything for less. Can we, you know, make a movie that really that the budget you know, equals or exceed, you know, that the worldwide value of the movie has to equal or exceed the budget. And that's really, at the end of the day, what we're all trying to strive for. And it's not an exact science, uh, unfortunately. Uh, we all try and use whatever means and methods we have at our disposal, whether it's, someone says, okay, I have a Nicolas Cage action movie. Yes, it's very easy to go back and try and figure out how many, what the last, I think he likes to make a lot of movies, the last 30 Nicolas Cage movies, have actually done in a specific territory. So yes, you can do some, you can actually do some analysis on something like that. But there are situations where it is very difficult to do an analysis, and you have to just try and do as much homework as you can. And it's really you have to be really cognizant of what's really happening in each of these markets. I mean, for me, and I'm sure for Milan and everybody, I'm watching international box office results every week from every country of the world. So I kind of know, you know, I'm paying attention, or should be paying attention to actually what's working in all of these territories around the world. I mean, you have a movie which I'm still astonished by, The Untouchables, which is literally the biggest movie. In a, I think everyone know what I'm talking about, the French movie, The Untouchables? So this movie, whether in Europe, and especially in Germany, was the biggest movie in Germany of the year. Um, and you have to pay attention to these things, and you have to sort of you know, try and, and figure out what is going to work and what is going to work on a macro level. There's a movie that I'm gonna that, that I'll give as an example that I didn't work on or have anything to do with, so I take it with a grain of salt. But uh, look at a movie like Bachelorette, which is uh, sort of an American independent comedy, similar to what we do at Big Beach, um, that that fascinates me because so this is a movie that has a great cast. Uh, uh, I think it was L Driver and Wild Bunch sold foreign on this, but with Kristen Dunst, Isla Fisher, um, Lizzie Kaplan. Um, they were at the budget, whatever it is, a few million bucks. They were able to go out and cover the, the sort of the negative on that movie just in foreign. So they would take that movie back to Sundance, sell domestic on that, and that's all upside for them. Then, as you follow that, I think that movie is innovative in that regard because it really is a, a, a specific American comedy that is being covered off of foreign pre-sales. But then, if, if you follow that all the way through its trajectory to the distribution, that's another movie that's really taking advantage of the sort of iTunes VOD, ultra VOD platform. It's coming out three weeks before it's coming out in the theaters. It grossed $500,000 on VOD in its first weekend. I think that's a movie to look at um, as a North American producer and say, okay, there's, there, they did something innovative there and that's something as a, as a producer that I'm looking at and saying, who can I cast that has foreign value in these smaller indie comedies that um, that I, can, that I can come back to Sundance or Toronto um, and know that, I'm, that I'm, I've got most of it covered. Can you come up with that answer? Let me know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that, yeah. 
I think uh, just to give them credit, it's uh, the Weinstein Company's new Radius label. Radi Radius did it. That's yeah. doing Bachelorette. That's done right. the sort of innovative launch well, of that. But but, but Jerry, to your point, like you'll see, I think some of these foreign sales companies will then give a producer like, here's your cast list. If you can cast A, B, or C out of this list, this equals X amount of money. And I, you know, I can't speak to whatever that Q value is or what you know, but. Um, no, having somebody that works at a foreign sales company that you can go to and say, here's who I'm looking, here's my 10 people that I want to cast in this movie. Is there any value there? Um, and, I mean, that's a starting point. And the, the thing to remember, too, is that the sales company is not there to tell you what movie to make. They're there to give you information and advice on what it means if you put one of these elements in there. You might want to make the small version of a movie with a Mark Ruffalo instead of doing the huge version of the movie with Bradley Cooper. Um, it's, it's there to give you guidance um, and say, this is the movie I want to make. Well, this is you know what the value is, and you've got to sort of scale your, your expectations appropriately. Um, so that they're there working for you. It's your movie. Um, and sometimes sort of the reality is a little stark and, and surprising in terms of what those numbers can end up with different levels of cast. Um, but ultimately, you get to make whatever movie you want to make. Well, let me put it in sort of another way. You know, so we get submissions, as all of our sales, we all do. We get submissions from people, and they go, so the first question we ask, here's the package, here's the script, here's the director, here's the cast. And the next question I ask is, okay, so what's the budget? And so I'm, I'm just making this up. The budget's $12 million. okay. So then we go back and do a little homework, do our evaluation. And again, a lot of this is not scientific. Uh, and then we go back and we go, okay, great. You want to make a $12 million movie. You should make it for six or don't make it at all. And, you know, producers go, well, what do you mean you make it for six? If the budget's 12. And I go, well, you need to make it for six, okay, or don't make it because the, 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 the math doesn't work. Okay? And, and then what usually ends up happening, then we'll get another call back. Okay, well, we've got the budget now down to 10. And I'm going, no, make it for six or don't make it at all, okay? Uh, okay, we'll call you back. Okay. Uh, we've got the budget down to eight. No, make it for six or don't make it at all. And then what usually ends up happening is they, everyone figures out a way to make it for six, okay? And the movie goes. And I think it's a really important analysis that you do need to look to the foreign sales agent. You do need to look to these call them, you know, people that seemingly know what they're talking about to really get an idea of what is the right price point for this movie. And that's what this is about. It's your price point. Speaking of price points, I, I want to talk a little bit more about the low budget end of the spectrum and obviously the risk reward balance is a little different there. You can maybe take punts on more films per year in the hopes that you get a bigger upside with one of them that can kind of balance out. I mean, what's the thinking of how much you can do or how differently you're going to work than Big Big Beach? Well, I mean, I think the, it's all, it, it, it all has to do with the amount of revenue that's coming back on film in general, right? And so we're seeing the collapse of the DVD market and there's just less revenue to be had, period, on film. Um, so you've seen, we're just looking at the domestic market, sales at Sundance, for example, which is kind of like 12 o'clock on our dial. Everything we make over the course of the year, we generally take the Sundance and sell. We sold them a Sunshine back in 2006, I think it was, for $10.5 million to Fox Searchlight, um, which at the time, and I think it still is the highest um, sale. But, you know, then the next year, the highest sale was $8 million. Then after that, it was $6 million. We sold already a brother for four something, you know. Um, so it, it just, it's been shrinking. So as a response to that, we figured, look, we, we want to keep making the movies with the same sort of creative integrity that we, that we have been. We just need to respond. And by doing that, you know, we're working with first-time filmmakers. We're shooting films in 18 days, 24 days. We're, you know, we're working in Seattle. We're working in New York. Um, who has a 30% uh, incentive? And yes, it allows us to make more movies. You have, um, you know, there's obviously more upside, um, and uh, and, you're, and you're, you you need to find talent that, that's willing to sort of take a pick at the, that wants to work for scale. These are movies where nobody's getting rich. You're giving the talent a piece of the back end. Um, and you're giving them an opportunity to raise their profile. Safety Not Guaranteed is a good example of a movie with three television actors who were looking for the right film role to step into. Um, you know, they embraced the movie. We went up to Seattle. We slept in this motel. You know, like it was, a, it was like camp. And um, but ultimately, everyone, everyone was satisfied at the end of it. And um, the movie did well. I think it's gonna, it's nearing four million at the domestic box office. And um, if we can repeat that, that's sort of the goal of this business, is to sort of repeat that. 
But that same filmmaker, let's say, if he, he's going on to his second and third and fourth films, he doesn't want to do it like he's at camp anymore. So what happens? So then? now, so then, so for example, Colin Trevorrow and Derek Connolly, who wrote and directed um, Safety Not Guaranteed, we now have a movie called Ambassadors that's at Big Beach, which is a bigger budget film. So in, in some regards, Beachside is set up to be, um, I don't want to call it minor leagues, but we, we are, um, we are a training ground. We want to work with these young directors, make their first films. If they have larger films that they want to make, we can do that at, Be at Big Beach. Um, but uh, you know, we'd also we look at a movie like Francis Ha, Noah Baumbach's movies that's here. You're finding a lot of directors now who have a great career, but are just frustrated. They're waiting around to see if they can get the right talent that's going to justify making that six to eight dollar, eight million dollar movie that Jerry's talking about, and it's not happening. They're saying, "Well, I just want to go make this with my friends." Can I raise seven hundred thousand dollars? David Gordon Green's got two movie, uh, one movie in the can called Prince Avalanche. They did with Paul Rudd and Emil Hirsch. He's got another movie that was just announced, I think, in screen with um, Nick Nolte. I'm sorry, with uh, Nick Cage. Cage. Um, you know, you're seeing these other uh, directors taking a step down in budget to go do, to make their movies, and that's we want to be there to help support that. I think even Joss Whedon's got a film he shot here in a week or, exactly. or something, and that, right. uh, along that model. Right. Um, uh, you guys uh, are talking about maybe about the lower budget end of what you work with, or can you work with new directors and sell their films successfully? It's tough. Yeah, go on. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it really depends on what the movie is. Um, generally, I mean, one of the things that you know we get asked to pre-sell sometimes are very small movies, and when, when you're pre-selling, you're you're doing two things. One, you're you're uh, mitigating your downside, but you're also limiting your upside. It's you're selling in advance to make the movie, and, and frankly, sometimes the smaller the movies get, that pre-sales, if you're looking at the risk profile of a movie, might not make sense. So below a certain size, like you were saying before, I just think, you know, get as much soft money as you can, as you were saying, and then it may just make more sense to make the movie if you really want upside to make it, because if you pluck off a couple territories for 50,000 here and 75,000 there, it might not make sense to give up that upside. It's an economic trade-off between the two. Um, so a lot of times we'll say, we'll get a movie and say, hey, look, this is fantastic, we like this, we'll commit to, to selling, but we won't bring it to market until, um, until the movie's finished. Um, making movies with first-time filmmakers, absolutely. Um, again, if they have a vision that they can communicate, sometimes that's with a sizzle reel, sometimes with its a vision statement, sometimes you bring them to the room. If, if you're agreeing to sell one of those movies, it's because you see something there. You're not saying, hey, I like the script, and I don't know what the director's going to do with it, but let's go sell it. But you can make substantively budgeted movies. We, we've, um, we've done some of them as well. And as long as you can communicate to buyers what this movie will be and why this person is going to do something great with it, um, I think there's value there. You're probably not going to be making a $30 million movie with a first-time filmmaker, but if you're making a $6 to $8 million movie, absolutely. And you guys don't work so much with... First timers, I don't think, um, or not right now. First time directors are, are challenging. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, not that they're any more or less qualified, but again, it's all about the pre-sale business. And every time we get a submission, and it's a first time director, of course. Oh, uh, J Jerry, you know he's done a music mu music videos, and he's done 1,800 commercials, and he won three different short film festivals, and that's all good, and that's all fine. But I mean, we have to communicate that to our buyers around the world. And depending upon, and Milan's right, depending upon the price point, again, it all backs into the price point. If you're gonna make a movie under $5 million and it's a really interesting piece of material, and this first time filmmaker was able to maybe really corral you know, an interesting piece of cast or two, and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a steady producer on board, yes, you know, we'll, bring the, we'll bring the director in, we'll have a meet with buyers, but again, it's a very time-consuming process. And you know, one thing that's, you know, what's not being said here is that all of us who are meeting with buyers, especially at markets, you know, we have a half hour to meet with a buyer. And we have a slate of movies that everyone is, is trying to pitch new movies, movies that are still, that are now on market two, market three, and you really only have a limited amount of bandwidth when you have a buyer in front of you for a period of time. So you have to be judicious in terms of what movies you are going to take on to really bring to the, and launch to the international marketplace. Okay. Thank you. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what is working. The good news. You know, what's working, what's selling well? There's, what, what there's are you, a lot what of good news. Okay, and I don't want, I mean, there's really a lot of good news. Um, little movies, medium-sized movies, they are working. And 
I, I think it's really important that, you know, and I'm sure for us and a lot and everybody, it's for us it's really about the material. It starts with the material, you know, and the material has got to be something that, you know, when you're when a buyer is reading, when I'm reading these on submissions, I'm reading them thinking, okay, what is a buyer in Germany, France, it'll, wherever you know, reading this gonna feel and think? Because okay, I was a buyer most of my life as opposed to a seller. And so I sort of like try and put a focus in in terms of what is a buyer going to perceive when, when they're reading this. Now, unfortunately, we're, you know, and I'm using, people use this example, we're not going to be you know, launching an American football movie overseas. We're just not. We're not going to be launching a hockey movie overseas. Unfortunately, you know, African American movies overseas are challenging, and that's just, you know, and there's nothing any of us can do about it. They just are. So there's a number, you know, black and white movies, unless it's an auteur director, are challenging. But, you know, it just really depends on, on what it is that you're trying to do and how you're going to go about doing it. I completely, completely agree with that. And, and you know, we talked about, one of the things we talked about before coming up here, sort of let's talk about trends and what's happening. I mean, one of the trends that we're seeing a little bit that feeds back into this uh, into this question a little is it used to be a few years back where you could say okay genre movies are working and everyone would go and just make a bunch of genre movies because it was you know at that time you had like a few years steady where they were constantly printing money and I think what we're seeing in the market now is that the oscillations between uh, kind of likes what's working and what's not is going so much faster and you don't know you know what's going to be crowded when it drops out quickly that the market's doing this a little bit so timing it from a perspective of I'm going to go out there and make a movie that's going to hit that is a really difficult thing and it really that it's it's not the approach to making films if you really want to be successful it's the do I have something great what do people want to see what will get them out of their houses into a movie theater and I know it sounds completely generic and 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 kind of obvious, but it's really, it's, is this something special? Because it backs into, if you're a buyer in the room and you're looking at something, it's gonna come out 12 months, 18 months later, you can't be timing it on what's working right now. And if you have a great piece of material and, it, and a great filmmaker and it, it's interesting and unique in some way, um, that's what works. Um, whether it's a little low budget movie, a mid budget movie, a high budget movie, it's, um, is, there, is there a value proposition here? Um, but trying to time it, because it's what you think people will want to buy. It's not about what you can get the sales agent to sell. It's about what will people distribute and make money off of 18 months later, 24 months later. Um, and that's why it's really about the movie and not about the sell. Yeah, I mean, to build off what Milan's saying, I, th I think that what I would encourage you guys as filmmakers to do is, is, is make what you know and not, not think so analytically about it. I mean, think intelligently about it, but not think so analytically about it that oh, I need to make a genre, an action movie um, that I can put guns on the, you know. Look at a movie like Beasts of the Southern Wild, which by all rights, there's, there's really, there's no concept to that movie. It's, a, the, it's an experimental movie, and, but it's a beautiful film. Here it is now, what, eight, nine million dollars at the domestic box office, where you've got genre films that, um, that are not doing that well. So if you're, you know, as a filmmaker, if it's something that you believe in, that you have the passion to tell this story and tell it well, I would encourage that rather than saying, well, I, just, I, I really need to get the Jason Statham movie off the ground because I think that's what, how I'm going to pay my bills. Um, I think the long, the long run is um, you know, to make what you believe in. Are there too many movies in the market right now? Big question. Uh, it's interesting you're bringing this up because I was just having this conversation with somebody. Uh, there was a period of time, and I, I can't believe it, if it was, remember, it was 08, 09. In fact, there's been two periods of time when there was a significant glut of, move, of independently financed movies. There was German, there was so much German tax shelter money around and there were so many movies being made and, you know, and the international markets became depressed based upon you know, the meltdown in 08 and there were just too many movies around. And it took some time for the movies to work their way through the system. And what, I'm, what we're seeing today is I think there is a significant amount of money around to make movies. Um, and there's money coming from all different sources from all over the world. And uh, we hope and, you know, that this isn't going to end up, you know, in a year and a half from now or two years from now, we're having the same issue where now there's just too many movies. Um, but what I do think is, is there is a correction here. There is, I think what's happening a little bit too is you now have most, if not all, major movie stars willing to be in independent pictures which I think is a little different than it was, let's call it four, five, six years ago. Uh, the independent space is now a space that is widely recognized. 
um, you know, agencies who had little divisions in this space. It's now, now the, all the, the agencies and all these agents in these agencies understand this space. And then you have the issue that, you know, the movies between 25, and again, a lot of people are in this room, I mean, this may not be relevant, but there's 25 to $65 million space, which the studios have abandoned, uh, is now really for a, like a film nation, and for us, is a really very lucrative area. Milan, anything to add? Yeah, no, I was just having like a, a nightmare moment where I was thinking about, you were talking about that period of time where there are too many movies. We actually, I, my previous job was at a company called Samuels Media, and uh, we financed two movies. One was Michael Clayton, and one was in the Valley of Allah, and they both came out within a one-month window against like, We Own the Night, Into the Wild, The Brave One. I mean, there was like, there was nine movies that were targeting the exact same audience opening on a four week stretch. I mean, it was uh, like, that was too many movies. I don't think we're, we're anywhere close to that because there has been a correction, but um, I think it comes in, I mean, there are definitely periods where you're looking at trying to sort of date a movie and you can see that there's, you know, a season or a stretch of, 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 of weeks where it's crowded, but I still think there's plenty of room. But, but I, I will say there are times where we look at the calendar where, when we say, wow, there, there isn't a great movie, there, is, there isn't a great date to actually put this in the theaters, we'd rather wait until the spring. Um, but, but I agree with Jerry that it's not really kind of like what it was five years ago where there's just too many movies and you're kind of preparing for a, for a correction. Movies aren't going anywhere. People are going to keep making more and more movies. So the result as filmmakers to think about is um, the, there's going to be less distribution. The chances of your movie getting picked up and someone touching you on the shoulder at a film festival and saying, hey, here's an offer, are very low. So as producers, as filmmakers, realize that when you get involved with the film, you're going to be involved with that film for a very long time. It's not just going to be like, oh, I passed it off to some other one who's going to take care of everything. More than likely, you're going to have to figure out how to get that movie into theater. So what, just, what, what was a, a one year to 18 month process of producing a movie just became a three to four year thing uh, where you're going to have to maybe raise money for marketing, maybe raise your P&A funds. So really love that project because it's going to be with you for a long time. I think all of this builds uh, to a question about how maybe VOD and non-theatrical is going to come into play much more for some films in coming years. And do you think it's going to impact every tier of the business, or is it just sort of that lower end of indies that are going to have this long tail and find a very niche audience online or on VOD? Any thoughts? Um, I sure hope VOD starts to rock out because uh, the video business as we know it, um, you know, first of all, the video business as we know it in Italy, Spain, Russia, Eastern <coughs> Europe is, bare, is, is almost non-existent. Um, and obviously the video business here in America and Canada, uh, I mean, it's still a viable business, but I mean, I'm not really sure that, you know, if we're sitting here in this room I'm not sure five years from now or 10 years from now, um, there's gonna be a physical DVD business. I can only tell you that my 25 year old and 27 year old, when I tell them I'm going to the store and go buy some UCDs or DVDs, they look at me like, what planet am I from? Okay, I mean, they, so I just, I'm sort of being guided by them and I think it's, you know, the physical DVD slash CD is, you know, going to be extinct. It's a melting ice. It's, it's an ice cube. Um, you know, and it, I, I think that question, it gets, we get asked that a lot um, when people come sit down with us at markets, and it really depends on the, on the time horizon. Like today, you know, is VOD really driving pricing? Not, not really. I don't think it, it might be sort of an added incentive, especially in some territories where it's, it's stronger than others, the UK, France, places like that. But it's not, you know, if you pulled it out, it's not like you're, the, the price point on, on what you're selling your movie for is going to change dramatically today. I mean, will that be different in three years? Probably. Um, I think VOD is really much more exciting now for the movies that don't get big theatrical distribution because there's still a way to get your movie out. And like you were saying, Michael, if you've worked on a movie for as long as you have, you want people to see it um, at any channel to get that out to as many people as possible. Um, you know, it's a really valuable tool. So. Within the course of a week, about, I don't know, six months ago, I got a call from my dad and a call from my mom. My mom was telling me that she loved this movie called Being Elmo, which was like an, an independent documentary. And my dad was telling me, talking about this movie called The Guard, which is a foreign indie film, 
where like 10 years, they, they watched them both on Netflix. And 10 years, they would never have known these movies existed. It would just was, and it was crazy to me to think like, oh wow, so this, this platform is really delivering these, um, these films to a wider audience. And it's really leveling the playing field for, for filmmakers who it's one click away or one button down. Um, and it's right next to Hunger Games and, and big studio fare. So, um, you know, the, the revenues will sort themselves out, and, and, uh, but just the ability to, to uh, be accessible to whatever it is, 150 million homes, is, um, I think is great. I think that there will be really interesting developments in sort of the, the, the realm of curation. It's as you get access to all of these movies, and, and you can go and you can sort of like look through online catalogs and you have no idea what to pick, is how people start to sort of filter through that and recommend and, uh, and, and say, hey, look, th this is something that is standout. You know, you can have these 400 movies that you can pick from. How do you pick? And I think that people will get, are, are getting very creative about how they steer uh, traffic um, to those things. Uh, one suggestion is if you have a title of your movie and you want to go VOD, have the title start with A. <laughs> <laughs> For obvious reasons. And Michael, I mean, with your films, especially under that one million budget level, can you start to convince filmmakers that a theatrical release isn't necessarily what they should aim for? There still is a sort of psychological divide, I think, that people want their film in cinemas. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that you're seeing. I mean, it's, it first started a few years ago when you started talking to filmmakers like, look, dude, we're not going to shoot this movie on film. This is, we're going to shoot on the red. Like, and, then, and that's the same thing you're seeing with, um, uh, with VOD. And I think most people get it. They just want their movie to be seen. Um, a lot of these, you know, in the, to, to, put a, to successfully put your movie on ultra VOD or VOD, you do do a, the, a sort of a token theatrical. So, and a lot of the filmmakers I know live in New York and LA, so they're going to get that token weeks run. Um, and they can invite their girlfriend out and party. But uh, I, I do think it's it's it is critical to think. Yes, it's on VOD, but how do you eventize that movie? So it's not just like we're sitting in the dark. Um, you know, so companies like Rooftop, companies like Kickstarter, companies that are that are getting people out in a social way to discuss these movies and watch them together are critical. And as filmmakers, we have to think about, you know, how, is this, how can we eventize this movie all the way from the script stage? Like, how is this movie going to be eventized um, so that it's not just sort of in a bubble on somebody's VOD channel? Um, I think some sales companies, you know, at script stage are now pushing things on Twitter, things that wouldn't necessarily have been a sales company's job 10 years ago or... Twitter didn't exist 10 years ago, but even two years ago, the, the sales company wouldn't have been doing that. Maybe the production company would have. Are you guys involved at that level, and is it Actually, dangerous? Actually, yes. I mean, we have this uh, untitled Rennie Harlan picture, which is based on a true story in Russia where in 1959, in the Dialsoft Mountains, these scientists woke up and they were all massacred. Uh, these very, very experienced hikers were killed and massacred. And from the inside out, and it was really never resolved how this happened, and, and it's been on the History Channel, and um, so we have a movie in post, uh, basically where hikers go back today and figure, trying to figure out what happens. And we actually hired somebody, a uh, social media company, to sort of spread this out and to sort of start, because there's so many blogs and there are so many sites on this incident, that we did hire some, we did hire a company to sort of bring this really more out of, into the social space in terms of, you know, asking questions and talking about it and do what people think and how did what really did happen and was, you know, the Russian government behind it and what, what really was the genesis of, you know, of their death. So the answer, I think, is yes. One of the things that's really interesting about yeah. transmedia and building um, sort of awareness um, using sort of online sites, Twitter, things like that, is that you're actually connecting a link, a direct link between filmmakers and their fan base, uh, which I think is really exciting. And you can start that early in the process of something like uh, like Looper, Brian Johnson. Um, he's got a devout fan following and uh, had a blog and just leaked out little bits of information. Hey, guys, here's what the time machine looks like. And, and you can start that, you know, during the production process early on. And so you're feeding them and just building that awareness and it, People are getting hungrier and hungrier to see the film so that by the time that the movie actually comes into theaters, there's just this huge kind of naturally grown buzz that, that um, picks up momentum as you get closer. But you can actually have filmmakers talking directly to their fans um, and laying the groundwork to position their movie, what's their vision, so they can understand it by the time they see it. And I think that's really exciting about, uh, uh, about the online world and transmedia and, and, and starting early with the process. You can have, you know, some filmmakers do blogs about 
you know, what happened today in shooting, and they have like a little paragraph. And, and for people that you know, are either excited about the movie and heard about it or like the filmmaker, maybe they just log in and it's their thing they check in the morning, and now they're really excited to see a movie when it comes out and they tell their friends, and that builds months and months before it actually goes to theaters. Just as an example of that, I had a conversation with a guy that runs the social media for a distributor recently, and we were talking about building a website and a social media presence for a film. Um, and he said, you know, it'd be great if we get this movie to 35,000 followers on Twitter. Um, and he said, you know, that'll probably cost about $35,000. So about a dollar a person. And, and if, if, if you can generate those followers, those likes, those, those friends on Facebook, um, for free while you're in production, while you're in development, um, you know, you're, you're saving money. And I, presumably that also you can go in and show a potential buyer, this film has 50,000 views on YouTube for the trailer, and does that help, I would assume? Um, it, 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 it does. I mean, the more, I mean, again, a lot of times if you've pre-sold it, um, you know, that, the buy's already happened, but you're actually, I mean, they're interested to hear what's happening with their movie. Um, you know, technology can be interesting in other ways too. It's like one of the things that we've spent a lot of time building is this sort of online web portal for our movies. It's basically like a social networking site for each particular film and it sort of faces in two directions. There's a distributor facing part of it and there's a producer facing part of it. The distributor facing part, it's like here's a way to use technology as a tool where you can tell those distributors that either bought the movie or haven't yet, here's what's happening with it and they can see what everyone else is doing. If France is releasing and they have a poster there, you know, in the German distributor, they're, they're not in, if you're selling it independently to each different territory, they're not in competition with one another. There can be lessons if a movie gets released, you know, positioned as a comedy in one territory and doesn't seem to work, but then it works, uh, you know, when it's positioned as a drama in another because it's sort of somewhere in the middle. If you can create an online community where distributors can learn from one another, that helps the movie. Um, and then technology is really interesting for you guys too because, I mean, it's something that we really believe in as a company is pushing information out. Again, the idea that it's your movie. And if you can have a website where you can give logins to anyone associated with the movie and say, well, here's the poster from Germany. By the way, there's a change in the release date in Russia. Um, we sort of, a lot of times, you know, we'll talk to filmmakers and they'll be like, you know, you know someone will tell them, hey, look, uh, you know, congratulations on your release in Russia. And the filmmaker will say, Russia, I didn't even know it was being released. And that's something that we try to avoid by doing this, which is, push that information out, and technology is really a way to do it cost-effectively. It saves us time and energy, um, but it's also great for producers and distributors at the same time. I'm going to switch gears slightly. We're going to open up to questions in a few minutes, but first I wanted to ask, um, I think it's always good to get a little bit of practical advice for people. So uh, going to ask you, what are the worst mistakes that young producers make that you see them making? Um. Some of the worst mistakes, I, I don't know about worse, but some of the, I think, issues that everyone should be cognizant about, before you set upon your journey to either you know, embrace a script or embrace material that you want to either produce or that you want to develop, you need to think about who is my audience for this movie, okay? Who, how am I, how is this movie going to get sold and marketed? Who do I think is going to pay ten dollars on a Saturday night, and put, you know, to come see my movie? When you understand that most of you know, there's a, there's this big country. I know we're in Canada, but there's this big country between New York and L.A. Okay? And what happens most of the time is for someone to go to the movies, it has to really peak some kind of emotion that they want to actually now get a babysitter, pay a babysitter. Take the time and you know and schedule. I'm going to go to a movie at eight o'clock at night. Pay a babysitter. Go maybe go to dinner. I'm going to buy some food. I'm going to buy some popcorn at the theater. And by the time they're done, they're spending a significant amount of money. And I think that two things have to happen. Three things have to happen. One, who's this movie for, and how's it going to be marketed? Two, are in the material are there characters or are there people that you want to leave that that you can root for? Are there people that you want to like in this, in, in this particular material? And, and three, I guess for, me, for us and for me, it's like what emotion, when this movie ends, is there any particular emotion that an audience is going to leave with? Are they going to be happy? Are they going to be sad? Are they going to be pissed that they just spent $50 to come see this movie? Or what is it, what emotion is this movie going to leave you with? And I think it's really important that today, because it's so competitive and because it's such a crowded marketplace, that an emotional 
aftermath is really, really important. Um, that was mine too. Um, I think I, I, we, yeah, we, we, we the, checked this out. <laughs> the, um, I think one of the things is it's a practical thing um, that I, I know I had done in the past a lot and um, I think people some, sometimes forget to do is just ask advice and that's on every, it's in every aspect of it. We talked about the foreign sales side of it but, but I think it relates to everything. I mean, we were gonna go shoot a movie in Hungary and we started reinventing the wheel, like looking up online and learning about the film credit and you know, what's gonna, you know, what are the best production services company? And it's like, if you look up recent movies that shot there, you can, through a friend, get to someone that made a movie there that actually made mistakes on the ground, saw what it was like to work with different people. If you pick up the phone and call them and say, who should I be working with here? What are the pitfalls? They've probably made 10 mistakes. You'll make 10 mistakes. You'll pass those on to people. But like, ask people that know better about something as simple as it is, that know more than you do. Um, because there are people out there, and it's the, it's the easiest, fastest, and safest way to get information, whether it's about how a tax credit works, whether it's about you know, which foreign sales companies do what, whether this financier is actually real. All of those things is pick up the phone and call people that have done it before, because they've probably made mistakes, and that's really how you learn. And they can walk you through that. Um, so one, you'll learn things that you won't learn just by researching and talking to people directly, but it'll save you so much time. It'll save you so much time, and there's plenty of work to do when you're making a movie that that, that becomes a very valuable thing. Yeah, I think so. I was going to be yeah, I was going to be get help, but I think I, I agree with that totally. I think the the one thing that I that and Jerry and Milan touched on this is that a lot of filmmakers are coming to me now and saying. Look, I've got this script. I take it around to the sort of companies in LA that have studio deals, and they're all telling me it, your movie doesn't cost enough. Um, I can only support a sixty million dollar movie, or I can't justify this movie. It's like this—that's the craziest mentality. Um, just go make it for cheap. I mean, I, and I, obviously it's a no-brainer coming for me, but I think a lot of people are waiting around trying to get that, even if it's you know, a twenty-five million dollar movie or that six million dollar movie. Um, figure out the way to go do it for $600,000. Look at Sundance this year. You know, the, the most profitable film on Sundance this year was The Sessions, or as it was called, The Surrogate. It's a $700,000 movie. It's got a couple movie stars in it. It's got three good locations. Um, and it has heart. Um, it's charming. Um, and it's old, and it's going to do well. So um, I just think, just go do it. Um, don't wait around. OK. I think that's a good time to maybe take a question or two, if somebody. Gentleman here. Uh, are you scouting talent? I cannot hear you. So you're asking, are you, are you scouting talent in Europe? in Europe? Are we scouting talent in Europe? We're scout. I think everybody, you know, you're not doing your job if you're not paying attention as to, you know, and you know, as to what talent is emerging throughout the world. And I actually think the trades, you know, especially screen, does a really good job of, you know, kind of, you know, keeping everybody abreast of what's really happening internationally, who's emerging from film festivals. You know, and by the way, as we all know, there's a film festival every day of the year somewhere. Okay, um, and you and you and you and you have to pay attention, and you know, and and so therefore, the answer, the, the short answer is yes. I mean, so you work a, a bit with foreign language film, right? I mean, how how much can you do with foreign language? If Are you asking me? <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, it, it's it's not something we do often. I mean, we have the. Uh, Pedro Almond of our films, uh, his, his last one, the one that he's, uh, he's working on now. Um, that's kind of a, diff a little bit of a different animal. Um, you know, we always look for them generally. They end up being a little too small, but there could be great ideas there. Or if it's just something that, again, if it's special and distinctive. I mean, every, every time we make a rule, we end up breaking it, which is why we kind of stopped doing it. I think when we started the company, we said, we're not going to buy any books the first 12 months. It's, it's long lead development. We're not going to do it. And four months later, we'd bought three books. So it's like, it. <laughs> don't ever like to say, hey, we, we won't do foreign language films. Um, we do have some of them. It's just a rare, again, it goes back to what we're talking about, the bullseye. Yeah. If, if you find it, yes, but the target's like this as opposed to you know, a domestic target, which is much, much bigger. Uh, I would love to be in production this year. Uh, I think it's, the, it's getting down to the wire for that. But uh, there's a few things that we're talking about, um, uh, yeah, as soon as possible. How many are you going to do per year? The idea was, to, you know, like, 
again, like when you say something, it never happens. But <laughs> we'd love to do, a, you know, I think in stride, we could do three or four a year. Um, I think it, when you're working at a lower budget, you kind of have to work in volume. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, with safety, we had a, we partnered with other, we partnered with Mark Duplass and Jay Duplass and their producer, Stephanie Langhoff. And I think in this, in this field, um, if we're partnering with, with other producers, we can easily do four a year. Any other questions out there? I think we're almost out of time. So um, I'm going to ask one final, very practical thing. So for the producers assembled here, what, would, what advice would you give to make the most out of the IFF experience and being in Toronto this year? Any, meet all the people you can? Meet all the people you can. Uh, don't give up. Uh, do not take no for an answer. Uh, be persistent, be aggressive, and, and at the end of the day, don't bullshit people, okay? Don't lie. I mean, if you don't have an answer to a question, if somebody who you're talking to is a professional and actually is reasonably smart and they ask you a question and you don't have the right answer, just tell them you don't have the right, you don't know, okay? But, I mean, what will end up happening is, and we've all seen it a lot, people come sit down and we start asking and talking to them and, they, and, then, and very, very quickly, we can ascertain if, you know, if they know what they're talking about or not. And then if they don't, or we sort of see that they're sort of going in a direction, you know, you, you lose our interest. And I think the other thing that's important, too, is when you're sitting with, you know, whether it's a producer, you are producers, or you're sitting with somebody that can finance your film or make it happen, be succinct, okay? Do not go into law and practice. You know, the art of pitching or the art of, you know, talking in a very succinct, you know, concise manner is an art. And unfortunately, most people in the film business and in this space are either ADD or OCD, okay? And <laughs> or both. Or both. Okay. <laughs> okay. And you can tell, and it just depends on who it is in terms of how fast you lose their interest. So it's really critical, okay, that you sort of look them in the eye, say what you have to say, and stop. I don't know how you're going to top that advice, but... <laughs> I'll go one step further. I would say, don't even go, like, for example, if, you're, if you have a project you want to pitch it to Jerry or Milan, I would say, like, network down. Go find their assistant and go to them, someone who's actually going to give you the time of day and say, not that these guys wouldn't, but, no, but I'm saying... But I, I have his home phone number. I have all of his... <laughs> He's making the smaller should, movies. We have all of his contact details. Maybe I should See say, like, afterwards. for example, <laughs> Harvey Weinstein or something like that. Find the, like, obviously, Harvey has a cadre of, of assistants. These people are smart. They're intelligent. He's hand-chosen them. If you find them, you're going to be able to establish a relationship with them that can be ongoing, that you can continue on. Whether it's, you, can, you might be able to shell something to Harvey. He's never going to remember what you said. So don't be afraid to, 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 to find the assistant of somebody and build those relationships because they're going to be lasting. Um, and I wish I had some very specific nugget, but it's going to sound generic too, but there's, it's, don't be shy. I mean, this is obviously an amazing group of people. You're going to get to know all of each other, but if you're walking on the street, it's such a wonderful festival that draws so many different people from different places. If you're sitting, waiting for somebody outside and you bump into someone, you say hello, ask them what they do. I mean, it's, it, it takes tenaciousness. You have to want it and it, you have to sometimes border on being rude a little bit, get to know as many people as you can. And it's not just, hey, it's just these people. If you're out and about at a restaurant and you overhear interesting conversation, be polite, just say hello, um, you know, if you're on your way out, something like that. Um, you have to fight for it. And then the, uh, the second part of it is, is follow up. Um, I met some really interesting, great people in festivals around the world, and then I get an email four months later that say, hey, it was great to sit with you on the bus coming back, and I have absolutely no idea who it was. If that email had come two weeks later, I'd be like, oh yeah, that person, they were nice, and then you know, right back, and then if, if you wait four or five months to follow up with people that you meet here, um, they're probably not gonna write back. Okay, so keep at it, I think, is the final word. Um, thank you so much to IFF for having us here and for the wonderful panelists for great insight.